Well, I'm so excited to be here at Saplo Farms. Thank you for having me, Gabe. Thank you. Thank um, you for and BA, thank you so much. And so for everybody, this is um, Gabe Marr and BA Lewis, and it's a mother-daughter team. And it's so exciting to be here. And I can't wait to show everybody your flower farm and your fields that you've got over there. But I'd love to hear um, how did you start doing flowers and a little history about maybe where we are. It's an amazing place and I know everyone will want to hear about it. We're in Silver Creek, Georgia. We've been here four years now. Um, we moved up from the coast. Well, farming is in our blood. My father, my parents were, um, I would have said, pre-depression. Mm -hmm. So it was not unusual for my father, my parents who were educators, it was not unusual for my father to plant 500 tomato plants and have <laughs> half the community out to can. Gabe grew up with that, sitting in the wagon, shucking corn with all the old maid school teachers. And so farming was just part of it. And when she came home from Maine, to, because grandmother was old and needed help and I was teaching, she said, Mom, we can sell produce. And I said, no, we can't. Nobody will buy it. Because everybody can grow it. Little did I know. Yeah. You know, and it just sort of exploded. And we were doing well there until the community developed beyond us. And we realized that we had to find some other place. And so we looked for two years for the ideal place and just kept coming back to Silver Creek. Um, we liked what we saw about Rome, the progressiveness with it. We liked this land. We needed some place we could move our livestock. Barns, fences intact, pastures ready to go, a house big enough for two families, and here we are. When we got here, Gabe said, Mom, I want to grow flowers. And I said, Okay. Why not? You know, we Why inherited not? something with this house that is a game changer, I think, for any flower grower. We have a walk in cooler. We had a walk in cooler when we got here. Oh, my goodness. So the ability to hold flowers was instantly appealing. And then we would go to the markets here. The first year we were here, we just sort of drove around and visited markets. And the first thing we did was run into three porches from a farm stand down in Marietta, which was just mind blowing. It was just the most beautiful thing. And there's so much joy in selling flowers to people. And we'd see all of our farmer friends with lettuce. And there's nothing about a head of lettuce that says, oh, I'm so glad I have this. <laughs> On the other hand, a bouquet of flowers can just change everything about how you feel. Sure. So we, we did, we started growing a few flowers and then that first winter that we were here, I took the florette flower course online. Um, and that next spring we expanded and have just been expanding the flower business ever since. Wow, so uh, about how much area do you have in production? I think it's about an acre and a half to two acres. Okay. Um, deer fence in, in production right now. So you grew up with this gardening side to you. So yes. that wasn't a foreign thing at all, but as you have you always been sort of, I guess, wanting to do flowers or you were involved with flowers in any way you know like i mean i see beautiful plantings around here so i'm just kind of curious my, my mother and my grandmother are both flower people okay. um, our yards were always looked like something that just was way bigger and more expensive than it should have been and we did some flowers with our produce business um okay. at mother's day we'd knock out 30 bouquets and that felt like the biggest thing we'd ever done it would take us all day to get together 30 bouquets and now we knock out 100 in an afternoon um, but those 30 bouquets are usually raped out of my yard. That's true. <laughs> That's absolutely true. I'm willing to steal flowers from our farm anywhere they grow. <laughs> and that continues here. <laughs> here, Mom, plant these, but I know you're going to take them when I plant them. Yeah. <laughs> As I said, pruning flowers helps them grow more. I'm just doing her a favor. What, what is the term that I heard one time? A civic pruning. That's exactly right. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. But that's okay. For the you know, common good. That's right. You know, we enjoy, we both enjoy growing things and seeing things grow. And I've enjoyed the flowers. Um, it's been different from the produce. We certainly haven't lacked in produce up here, but you know, we've made a name for ourselves. It's different for Sapelo Farms that we didn't have down South Georgia. That's with the flowers. Mm -hmm. So I know I loved, you know, when we were talking earlier, how you brought up the fact that, you know, you have this piece of property and it needs to generate revenue. I mean, it's, you want to put it to work. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us a little bit about what ev everything you do, because you do so much more than flowers on this piece of property. Well, there's about 180 acres of open pasture land here. And we grew a lot of hay in Brunswick on the coast and sold it. We grew horse quality hay and good cow hay. I like to raise, we sell grass-fed beef and grass-fed goat. 
Well, grass-fed products are only as good as the grass that goes into them. Absolutely. So we have to be the forage farmer. So I've had to learn a lot about, we both have, about how to handle the different grasses that are up here. But, you know, you saw slick, pretty, fat, happy cattle <laughs> and squirrels, they're eating good quality grass. Yeah. And that's our goal. This year, for the first time, we've started cutting and selling a lot more hay. We pre pre produce all the hay their animals eat and can build a market, we think, here with good quality hay. Um, the rest of the land, the other 200 acres, is going to be in timber. It already is. We're harvesting some of it and going to replant it because it needs to be productive. Right. Um, what else do we, we have? Bees. Gabe and David, my husband, have bees. We, we've got flowers. You got to have bees, right? So they raise honey, and we sell that. And you know, we'll, we we sell replacement nanny goats, and we'll sell replacement heifers in time. Sure. And occasionally we sleep. <laughs> <laughs> in the winter. <laughs> I mean, it never Not stops. <laughs> I know, I was going to say, it never stops. But, um, uh, you know, one thing I noticed, um, and I think, you know, we've even talked about it a little bit, is your practices. And so, uh, very impressed. I mean, it, everything seems to be very natural, how you approach things here. Um, have you, I mean, is that something you can translate into everything you do here? I think for us it's going to be a learning curve here. We did sure. move into some soil problems and some weed problems that we've had to combat, um, hopefully in ways that will all will change as we go. It's an evolving process for us. We don't want to have to haul in the amount of lime we've had to haul in. We certainly don't want to have to do the amount of spraying to get rid of. We came into a field of nettle higher than my head. Um, so, well, one year, one one of our first things we did here was we cut a pickup truckload of nettle this big musk nettle that gets you know tall and blooms beautifully gabe and david and i went out there we took a hunt 221 pounds of thistle heads to the dump i that's how badly the soil had been neglected here but, you know one of the first things that we did when we moved in here the people before us were raising cattle but the cattle had the run of the entire farm and we have a very nice creek and one of the things that brought us here was springs there are five springs on this farm really the cattle were everywhere. So I went into NRCS and I said, we need some fencing. Mm -hmm. So the very first year we were here, we fenced the cattle off the creeks and the springs. They no longer have access. Along with that, we put in frost-free water troughs. And it just happened that we put in our water trough on the other side of the flower garden. So the piping ran through there and we could tie it into the garden. It's very convenient. But, wow. you know, we, we're, we were raised by a gentleman who was environmentally conscious and we're going to be good stewards we're going to take care of this land because this is the best thing we have sure i love everything about that i, I think too many times people um really take advantage almost of their property and they don't realize um uh, it's just like this week you know our episode we released with jenny love there's so much uh there's so much research now that's coming out um, and it's funny, it's kind of like, there's a lot of old school ways that are now being validated mm -hmm. that if you can take care of your soil and you can take care, you know, of just, you know, like making your resources, your resources, absolutely. That in the end, um, it will pay you back tenfold, right. um, if not more than that. And you so, know, yeah. one of the reasons that we're fighting so many weeds up in this garden up here is that it was pasture. We just, sure. gave, for two years, Gabe looked around and she said, that's, that's where I want it. So we put in the deer fencing. And now every time you till something, the weed seeds that have been there for all these years are coming up. Turn back up, yeah. That's right. But, you know, we'll lick it. We'll get it. Yeah. The pastures already are in better shape than they've ever been. Just We've done a lot of mowing to keep the weeds from going to seed. And that puts stuff back into the soil. Right. That old-fashioned idea of, you know, maintenance like you were talking about. Um, so it's, it's, it's happening. Mm -hmm. And that's, I'm glad you said that because when it, wh whether it's weeds in your flower beds, weeds in your flower garden, weeds in your flower fields or pasture, um, an ounce of prevention is worth, you know, a ton of cure because if you can stop them from going to seed and break the cycle, it may take a year or two, but more than that, but, I know yeah. you're absolutely right. But I'm just saying, but you can see the difference year after year after year. If you can nip things before right. they go to seed and then, I mean, cause we were looking at that spiny amaranth 
in the gar in the flower uh, area. And you know, one of those plants probably produces 10,000 seed, um, and they're like dust. And so it's kind of like it's it's hard. I know one of the things we struggled with was uh, this little weedy mar uh, morning glory, and you know, that little white trumpet flower. Mm -hmm. and it's like. I, like how many seed can one plant produce? I don't even know, but it was like that was always our nemesis because they'd hide under plants and then right. all of a sudden it's bloomed. You're like, how did that happen? How did that get by us? It's it's crazy. So how long have you been on this property, then? Four years. Four years, and you've April been... was four years. Wow, that's amazing. And and you've been growing flowers that whole time, or did you? Yes. And we started the flowers the first. We we moved up in September and we started that that spring with flowers. Right. Wow. You primarily go to a market to sell your flowers? It's sort of, um, a lot of things happened for us moving here that timing was just perfect. There's a really high-end market between the Rivers Farmers Market that opened in Rome, which is a grower-only uh, market that just sort of brought Rome together. I think Rome was at the point when they were ready for a big high-end market. Something like that, yes. Um, and the first year that we went, we, we, couldn't, we didn't have enough flowers to sell at the market. Um, and then we've added a CSA, and now we're doing some boxed flowers with the pandemic out. We have some contactless pickup points um, where flowers are going into Atlanta, too. Well, let's go back and add that year before Between the Rivers started, we did hit a few little local markets, and we'd go in with bouquets and then leave there with leftover bouquets. Well, what do you do with them? I went to the hospital. I went to hospice. I went to every we person gave away, that we gave away. Gave away, gave away we gave away, gave them to chamber of commerce we gave them away to attorney's offices we took them into restaurants i mean flowers are meant to be shared Absolutely. they're meant to be enjoyed and Absolutely. so we just made sure that we didn't come home with them somebody you know she and would go that way and i go this one way one of the most wonderful things about growing flowers is even if we have a slow day we have extra flowers we always know we're going to go to these places and we're going to drop off flowers that's right and the pandemic first started we went to our local coffee shop a couple weeks in a row with a box take a flower tag us in it share some with a friend just to get flowers in people's hands because that's there's a joy in that. There's, there really is. There really is. And especially during a pandemic, everyone needs a little sunshine and joy. That's right. For sure. And the other thing, I, you know, and, and I know that this wasn't your intention, but I do think that it helps bring awareness to your brand, to, to what you're trying to do here, um, where people look for that product or they're trying to, um, like, oh, wow, here's a new person here for us to look for. Um, and so, now, I know you mentioned Rome, and I know we're in North Georgia. How far is Rome from where we're at? Eight miles from where you're sitting. Oh, wow. So, that's not, so, it's around the corner. Right. So yeah. That Harrison goes to preschool at Barry. Okay. Good, so. Okay. And then, um, and so, is that market on Saturdays, or is it, is it just the one day a week? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much thank for and letting us just drop in on you and opening your home and your garden to us. Like I didn't so have to weed this afternoon. That was nice. I wasn't on my hands and knees. Thank you. <laughs> that whole mother-daughter thing. It's always a give and take. You, know, you can call me anytime. I'll be here. Okay? <laughs> well, come back. You want to come help weed? <laughs> we do have plans and we do. One of the things we love about what we do is that it's always the results are there. We can make a change this year and then next year we see that change. So we, we do intend to continue to grow it and to continue to improve it. This is a beautiful piece of property. It just needed to be taken care of mm -hmm. and to be made productive, and we're going to accomplish that. Mm. Wow. Thank you guys again. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is an amazing patch of Rebecca, and I see all these different varieties. You know, sometimes that just happens naturally, but it looks like you have a mix here. Is it a mix or? We did. We grew about eight different varieties this eight. year and just seeded them in. So, do you remember the, the series or the variety in it? Because, I mean, I love these, like, doubles and... The double was Goldilocks. This was Chimichurri. Um, cappuccino is down on the other end. That's the darks. Sure. Well, let's walk that way and we'll see. And then your cottage jar here, I don't know if you can see that or not, but the cottage jar, did you start... Was this overwintered or did it... We did overwinter that, yes. Okay. Everything that you see right here, we overwintered. All right. That's awesome. Do you, um, do you buy any plugs in or do you start everything yourself? We don't, we grow everything. That's awesome. That's really incredible. Let's go see this other variety. Now, I know I want to ask you the question. Um, this Cosmos is not usually a cut flower. So what are you doing with this? Because it doesn't hold up very well, does it? No, it really doesn't hold up as a cut flower. We, uh, we're using it as an edible, an edible flower. An edible flower. I think I want to try one. I don't know. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I 
I think it's more for the look than the taste. Yeah. Uh, it's funny, it has sort of an herby dill kind of taste almost. It's, it's weird. But hey, you never know until you try. All right. So when do you typically, and over here in the south, so typically when do you plant things out like this that you're going to overwinter? We try to have everything in by the end of October. Um, it just depends on how much we're still having to harvest and cut and clean up. Um, this didn't make it in quite that early. We were September, I'm sorry, we were November getting it in. Sure. Um, but we like we like to be done by October. I understand. Wow. So, um, gosh, this is amazing, this color and the flower shapes. And of course, the bees seem to be loving it. Um, what, what variety? Is this the cappuccino? That's the cappuccino, that's okay. right. Yeah, all the darkers that you see. Mm. That is so, so pretty. You know, one thing I've seen too used a lot, which I always think is interesting, um, is the seat, like when the flowers start to pass, is to pull the petals off and then just use the black centers, kind of like scabiosa pod. Um, it's an interesting. You know, That's a great idea because it has such a strong, sturdy stem. Yeah, so it's, it's something you can use. Yeah, I had a thought pinch. That. Okay, so I know that it's been an unusually wet um, year and you know, I'm just amazed. I, I don't know if you can zoom in on these this lupin over here. <laughs> they grew lupins last year. Tell us about that. You grew them last year and what happened? Two years ago, we had a very, two. very cold winter. That was the winter we had. We had two weeks that didn't get above freezing. It was just bitterly cold. And every lupin in our patch bloomed. We cut lupin. We had bouquets of lupin. Last year, we didn't grow it at all. We just didn't get to it. So this year, we thought, well, if we have another cold winter, it's something we can overwinter and not worry about. So I think we've had about four blooms on it. That's so sad, but I've never seen lupins blooming in Georgia. So that is definitely, uh, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm, I'm really amazed. Well, don't try it. It takes up too much space as a, as a test run, but. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, still, kudos to you. Uh, is that, is this Gallardia next? It is, yes. Um, that was a disappointment for us this year, sort of sim length, and we overwintered it. Um, I, I don't know. Well, well it's I mean, one of my favorites, and I begged her to try it. Well, I, I, there's a lot of really great Gallardia varieties. Um, I know these plants look so healthy. I bet they would perennialize here if you let them. We're actually going to dig them up and donate them to her flower beds. And, and then if <laughs> they, <laughs> these, and then if they do grow well, I'm going to cut, cut them, them out of my flower That's bed. Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing around here is sacred. No, you know what? Um, I, I, being the gardener uh, type of person, nothing in my house is sacred either. So. I tell her if you keep cutting, it'll keep blooming. That's what I'm doing That's for right. her. That's right. So you're really trying to help her out. Absolutely. <laughs> I love so there's so many sunflowers in this row and I can see they're more of the branching varieties, which I'm still intrigued with a little bit. Um, I love, are there, is there multiple varieties in this row? Cause I see some with the brown centers and then I see some with like a green center. I think there's three varieties in that row. Yeah. So maybe this is a white variety. That's correct. Yes. Okay. So that's that sun fill. Right. So they're just, they're, they're a little bit later but you can see they're gonna be a lighter color. I wish I, oh, we can show that one over there, because that's her. Well, this is amazing. Like, the, thing, the other thing I love, there's a lot of people who won't grow sunflowers because they take up too much space. You know, and it's one cut per you know, stem. You don't have any repeat bloom to it. But the branching, I feel like you really can get a lot of bang for your buck here. We've cut the old row over there for three weeks. Seriously. Seriously. So if you come in here, is this a stage you would cut it at? Yes. Okay. So you've got a couple buds and you've got this flower fully open. If you cut it at this tighter stage, will it continue to open? Right. Mark it to show people a flower that hasn't opened yet. They can't envision that it will open. Right. So we tend to cut almost fully open. Well, I think that happens too, because a lot of times people get burned where they, they right. get told that and then it doesn't happen and then it's frustrating and all that. But that's, that's really amazing. So if you come in here and cut these, and I can see like one stem's already been cut, um, will it continue to branch out more or once you cut it, it's, it's done? They've been branching out more for us. Have they? Okay. I love it. These are beautiful. I'm really encouraged by this. I'm glad to see you doing this because um, on the wholesale level, it just, we had bad experiences because of things not lasting long enough. And I don't know if it's because they cut them to open, but we were only getting three or four days in a vase uh, once we received it, like in every one in the cooler. 
but I'm excited to hear that there are some varieties that are holding better. I think the bunch on our counter is at seven days now, and you mm -hmm. can't tell yeah. it's been there at all. No. That's crazy. And and I, I haven't remembered to just change the water. No, I haven't. I <laughs> but the, now, I will say this too. The Pro Cuts, I mean, they drink so much water. Do you still have that with this these branching types? We really haven't. No, not not nearly like that great big stem that we were talking about earlier on the Pro Cuts. Yeah. I love the size of these for bouquets. I don't know if you can tell, but this is such a small little guy here. Great, I love these. This, this makes me happy. Well, I know that when you're growing things, things happen. And obviously you have some beautiful Lysianthus, but it's really short. And, um, you know, when I like to learn a little bit more about and maybe, uh, maybe this will help somebody and we can figure out what's going on. Um, I did call uh, Georgia Monroe from Base Camp. We were talking about it. So when did you plant this particular batch from Lizzie? We got these in about mid-April. And so, and you started these from seed. We did. Which, my hat's off to you because that is that is an ambitious project. Um, the flowers are just so, so beautiful. Um, I mean, they're just so perfect. And I love them, they're just so short. And so I know when we were talking to Georgia, she thinks that maybe it could be, you know, you've had so much rain. Right. Um, also, it could be day length a little bit because maybe certain varieties like longer days or shorter days. And this variety thinks, uh-oh, the day length is getting messed up, so let's go ahead and bloom. So um, there's all kinds of reasons. But you know, you learn stuff every day, every year, right? Absolutely. And you don't know till you try. So. I always joke about, how farming is, you know, you can go to Vegas, it's kind of the same thing. You never know who's gonna win, and who's gonna be a winner and who's not. But if you don't know, you don't try, or you don't try, you don't know, and you always learn something. So it's always great to, to, to put it out there and try. So thank you for showing us this. Great. Well, um, one of the things I am amazed by is what is right here in front of these sunflowers. Uh, it looks like two different kinds of basil. What what are you growing there? It's a lemon and a Thai basil. I love that. Now, is this something you've grown before? Yes, yes, we use it in our bouquets. And um, when we get up and get the flower going to it, we strip it down and we just have the, these are the two points in the center arch. Sure. And um, so these went in recently? They did, maybe a week and a half, two weeks ago. Okay. And then how long, I, I don't know everything's very, but I, is this for the fall? It will be, yeah. yeah. We're running late on that. Um, yeah. Well, it's a great crop. I mean, I love this fragrance of basil. I don't care. I mean, I have at home right now this big old pot, and I don't even know how many plants I put in it of spicy glow basil, and it's, it's one of the Thai varieties. And it's just, uh, I mean, I was doing a video today, and I'm just like getting the wind wafting, and it's just so amazing. And I think it's one of those things that when you put it in a bouquet, People are like, what does that smell? And then, then they find it. And I always love that, how that scent of, you know, this, the sense of smell draws them even deeper into the bouquet they just bought. And I think it's amazing. VA is our, our mint guru. We have really, really tall mint. And we put mint in a lot of our market bouquets because you touch a bouquet and you smell that and it just, people say, what is that? Yeah. You know? Right now we're using mint and oregano. Our oh, oregano really? is what? Mm -hmm. oh, we have wow. some oregano. We have some oregano and some tall blooms. Oh, I want to see that for sure. Um, I think and, I mowed it down. And <laughs> <laughs> so it'd grow again. <laughs> I understand. Well, the thing I love about the mint you grow is it's not the sort of traditional mint you think of. And so you see this bloom or you see this foliage and then you see this, or you smell it, you know, it wafts. It does. And, um, it's it amazing. Does. Okay, so here's the zinnias that we saw over there that were so tall. These are babies. This is so beautiful and I, you know, I love seeing the fabric down because I feel like it does prevent a lot of weeds, um, which of course saves on labor, which of course saves on your knees and your back. Which of course, I mean, you can go on and on and on. Um, and this, this whole system reminds me a lot of what Erin Benzikin kind of developed. Did you take her class? I did, yes. Yeah. So what did you think? I, I learned more than I ever thought I would learn. Um, crammed into a six-week period about flowers. <laughs> well, it's amazing. And, 
you know, and I feel like a lot of what she's done is just really revolutionized the whole floral growing process. Um, I mean, obviously, a lot of the stuff may be common sense, but at the same time, it's nice to have everything packaged in a way that, you know, is digestible and you can adapt for your system. I know here in the South, sometimes, um, you know, we obviously grow things a little different than you can up in Washington, but it's, but I still think well, some of the practices are very helpful and very, you know, weed control and, you know, trying to get everything close and strong and sturdy. You know, this is just looks so great. Uh, how do you fertilize in this situation? Do you do it through irrigation or do you do it overhead? Do you spray? I'm not using fertilizer at all. I'm cover cropping and putting it back in. Okay, so you're feeding the soil. That's correct. Right. Okay, so, you know, a great topic. We're going to have to actually have this conversation. I, I, it just keeps coming up. Um, the soil is the key to so much that we don't have to use synthetic fertilizers. We don't have to do a lot of different things because the soil can be our ally in this. And so it's so exciting to see this. We've got beautiful marigolds back here. I uh, can't wait to kind of walk through the dahlias behind us because that's always fun. Everybody loves dahlias. And um, how high do you put your netting? We just sort of bump it up as we go. Um, we, we have to use four people to get the netting in. Um, yeah, I like stuff. <laughs> so we, we throw it down, then we, we bump it back up depending on what we're trying to net. Like these marigolds will get a lot taller than the zinnias. So it, it's kind of an influx thing. We sure. adjust as we go. No, it makes sense. And did you bend these yourself or did you buy them done? We did bend them, yes. You did. Is that we, hard? I've never done that. No, well, we use a Johnny's hoop bender. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, and we overwinter a lot of things in hoops with plastic. We don't have a greenhouse. So the hoops are here mostly to hold the plastic in the winter and they help us hold the netting in place. In the yeah. Summer. I mean, that's so wonderful because, you know, it's it's kind of like, you know, we are still so warm here in the south that you could, this, it's the perfect buffer for just taking the edge off the frost and the freeze. I mean, yeah, I mean, you still lose a few things. and Or maybe you don't lose, but you get some burn back. But. We, we lost the entire planting of stock inside of a tunnel, but really? everything else we ever wintered, no problem. That's great. Depends That's awesome. on the week and the month, right? Well, Depends on the winter. You're right. Yes. You're right. And if there's any polar vortexes going right. on. Right. Right. Maybe this is a variety that I grew because I remember it's like this pinky, right. and some pink in it. I don't know if you can see that or not, but... I that love that there. color. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I like those edges on it and the way it does. Um, yeah, it's just a fabulous zinnia. Of course, I don't know that I've ever met a zinnia I didn't You didn't like. like. Yeah, so it's amazing. I have to show you one before we leave that we got from Seed Savers for the first time this year. It's called Whirly Gig. All right, so I love the dahlia patch. I can't, I mean, they're just amazing. I can tell right now that you're already setting buds. I see some flowers, but I also see some freeloaders in here. What's going on? So last year, our celosia patch was exactly the opposite up in the zone ahead of us. And we pulled the landscape fabric out over here to dry and the seeds fell off the landscape fabric and they came back in the dahlia patch. <laughs> but they're free, so we're planning on cutting them anyway. Right, you didn't have to start them, you didn't have to water them or weed them or whatever. Yeah, so, and plus they probably helped choke out some weeds along the way. We so, wish. Yeah, so amazing, amazing. I love it. Um, so, do you overwinter your dahlias? Do you store them? We dig. What do you do yeah. with your dahlias? We, we dig and store and then divide in the spring and plant again. Okay. And that's how do you have a lot of varieties you grow or i think we're about 15 varieties right now and then some stragglers we try to add in a few new ones every year so there's always one or sure. two that we're pinching and cutting and rooting and hoping to get more of sure awesome so one mistake i did my first year growing dahlias was i bought certain varieties that i thought they could cut flowers but they were really short or small and i see this this beautiful little flower down here i'm gonna pick it um, are all of these bigger varieties or is this just the first bloom? So the, the answer is both. Um, some of these, these white guys we planted, we actually planted and bought to put in flower bed. And then they ended up here because they were doing little work with them. Um, these just need to be staked and pinched. They've gotten down on the ground. Oh, um, I see. We're okay. behind okay. the season. Wow. All right. So Scabiosa, um, it's, this is such an amazing stand of it. Um, I can't get over it. When did this start blooming? We started cutting it um, about the middle of April. Middle of April. So when did you plant it? We overwintered it. We uh, planted okay. it probably when in 
Early November? Yeah. Again, we wanted to get done in October, but right. it didn't happen. Right. And with all the rain you've had, I, you know, it looks like it's really thriving. This is one of the things that took the rain. Uh, we had some crops we just lost because it was so much rain, but it, it just took it and has been just a workhorse. Yeah. And did you, again, did you plant a mix? We did. Yes. Okay. And so that's why you have the whites and it's all mixed up and it's, I mean, it's just amazing, these colors. And for whatever um, reason, the white came in first. It seemed like for two weeks we only cut the white, and then the purple or the blue has been late. you mind if I cut oh, one? So, I mean, look at this. And I even like having these side sheets. Usually when we get it in from the professional growers that are, you know, doing Whacking millions off everything. of them. Yeah, it's like, it's just... I don't know. That's just so, so and We beautiful. even cut some and left the seed pot just for texture. Right. Because once they get cleaned off, once this is all off, just that textural element is great. In now, so, you know, we're all used to that round globe looking scabiosa pod that, right. you know, we see in all the photo shoots. And even though I've seen this pod before, how does this dry? I honestly don't know. Okay. I'm, I'm afraid that it's not going to dry too well. As you can see this one, it's already starting to come apart. Right. That's what um, I was wondering myself. But I really don't know. That's something we're going to have to figure out this year. We have plenty to try, so we'll see how it goes. Well, I know one year we received some scabiosa pods from like Chile or somewhere in South America. And I think they were trying to get into that market. Um, of course, they have it usually in January because they're in the south of Southern Hemisphere. But um, they didn't hold up well. And that's why I was wondering if maybe they just, sometimes they get so anxious that they cut things too soon. Right. Um, and so I was a little nervous about that. That's why I was curious. But now I agree. It's almost like it's got too much moisture in it. It doesn't have that airflow to dry it out. Well, just so many beautiful varieties. Is that it over there too? Yes, it is. Wow. It's amazing. Great job. This is so pretty. I love this color. This is the fall color. That wedding we did was all fall deep burgundy blush olive. There was a ton of that. Amazing. Well, I, I don't think you can probably hear it, but these these are just covered in bees and pollinators um, that are all happy as can be. Um, so tell us about this flower, oh. Gabe, because. I have never seen this flower growing this fabulously here in the South. Thanks. This is a Chinese forget-me-not. And we just, we love the blue color, like you. It's a color that's just so unique and a stem or two in a bouquet just really makes it pop. So we direct seeded this back in April um, and just beginning to harvest it, probably been harvesting for about a week um, and hoping to get another week or two out of it before the, the sun and the heat take it. Wow. I am so impressed. Um, is this their first year growing it? That's correct. Wow. So typically, you, I know you don't know because of that, but do you feel like you can cut, like it'll just keep coming or is it all bloom at once or? No, we've been able to cut and come with it. We've cut that center you? stem and then gotten some really good side shoots off of it. Oh, I see, wow. Yeah, it's amazing. And the stem length is great too. I know when I was buying for the wholesale house, we were always bringing in this product from Europe, like right. from Holland. And the stem length was okay. But it was so weak, you know, but this is like... Yeah, it, it's been really good to us. Uh, strong. It's, it's just that perfect shade of blue. And here's a little bit that's a little behind. Right. But, um, which is great too, because it'll just, it'll give you an extension on the season. Um, there's another amazing white variety of this that if you, if you can do this, this is an amazing, amazing flower. I'm so glad to see that. Well, I've never grown amaranthus before. What variety is this? This one is Emerald Tails. I've always been concerned, and I can see you've had some beetle pressure. Right. Um, it's, I know that's sometimes frustrating, but the great thing about amaranthus is nobody needs the foliage because it doesn't really last. It's cut that well. Um, you are natural. You do everything natural. There's no sprays that's or right. anything like that. So, um, do you notice where it affects the flowers? No, no, that hasn't seemed to mess with the flowers at all. So we just strip off all the foliage. Sure. Um, it takes a little time, especially when we get up on these little guys. Sure, but sure, sure. Clean it all off and you never know. If you yeah. hadn't been out here to see it, you wouldn't know there was a problem. Well, I'm really excited about this variety down here. So we're gonna go check this out. And then you've got Celosia. Is this a mix? It is. Um, these are some Celosias that we got out of Florette this year. Oh, new. yeah. yeah. Yeah, we love Aaron. I mean, just amazing. The, I mean, everything. Every, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, I, you know, I'm going to, I want to ask this question now. 
Uh, most of what you produce, you sell through farmer's markets, you said? That's correct. We do farmer's markets. We have a local CSA and we drop off and pick up. And then we're using a delivery service. Tucker Farms is with their vegetables delivering into Atlanta. Okay. And so when you're selling at the farmer's market, are you primarily doing bouquets, arrangements, straight bunches? Everything we've done so far has been bouquets. Just mixed bouquets. Great. Do you have one size? Do you do two sizes? or Even if we have more than one size, we just call it all the same size to keep the okay. confusion down. Yeah, I understand. Um, okay. This is great. Um, I love, this is a great mix. I, usually I'll, I see these mixes and sometimes the color mix isn't very even, um, but this is a beautiful mix. I just haven't figured out what we're going to mix this with. <laughs> I mean, or bouquet. Right, yeah. 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 It, it's, a, it's a very, it's, we're calling it neon. It's a very neon color. No, I can see that with the yellow. Well, I don't know. The Gumfrina is really pretty, and I bet you, uh, we'll so you'll, we'll you'll figure it out. You know, the thing about color is, and I always say this: color sells. Right. And so, you know, people see that makes them bright, especially with pandemics going on. It's you know, bright, cheery, happiness. We were having that conversation at market. I think we've been at market with sunflowers three weeks now, and the minute sunflowers came, yeah. it didn't matter what the sunflowers mm -hmm. were mixed with. That's, that's what, what everyone wanted. wanted. It, it amazes me how that flower is. Really, the it is, it is really the is. market flower. Yeah. Well, when I saw this when we pulled up, I was like, wow, I love, this is one of my favorite amaranth. It's like for wedding work, it is the most popular one. Um, what, which variety is it? I think this is coral charm. Coral, I think, I think you're right. It's coral something, but yeah, yeah. it's, but you know, it's, it's such a beautiful shade of this peachy salmony coral color. Um, I just I just love this variety and again you just pick the leaves off right so I mean it's beautiful and everything Gosh. so at what stage do you cut this flower this is probably about as far as we would have let that go okay um, because it starts to green up here at the end right, right. and then it feels like it starts shedding I understand. it's the last thing I want to have happen right right